All right, for those of you that don't know, I pretty much played exclusively on consoles from like the launch of the PS2 until pretty much the end of the Xbox 360 timeline. About five years ago, coming back to PC, I was still really proficient with the controller. It took me a lot of time to adjust the keyboard and mouse. Now, now, of course, I love the accuracy that a good keyboard and mouse setup provides. I hardly ever use a controller for anything, except for driving games. For driving games, I still really like the feel of a controller. A lot of it has to do with the analog input. And I played a lot of Grand Theft Auto V where you're on foot with shooting mechanics some of the time and behind the wheel and driving is very important other times. And to solve that problem for me in the beginning, I would keep a wireless Xbox 360 controller on the desk, actually still do, and I'd switch back and forth from keyboard and mouse to the 360 controller. Obviously, this is not an ideal setup, so when I heard the guys over at Wooting Keyboards were working on a keyboard that was gonna have functional analog input on the keys, I was very intrigued. So let's take a look at the Wooting One. You're looking for cheap PC games? Check out Kingwin.net. Click the link in the description below to help support the channel and never pay full retail again. Yo, I'm Brian P. You're watching Bad Seed Tech, and today we're taking a look at the Wooting One Analog Keyboard from Wooting. This is a 10 keyless design that uses Flare Tech Prism switches. They use optical sensing as opposed to a set actuation point that you'd find on most mechanical keyboards. At a price point of 140 US dollars, it's priced in roughly the same tier as other TKL keyboards from the likes of like Razer, Corsair, and Steel Series but it's got a couple of really big tricks up its sleeve. Now, I think it makes the most sense to review this like a standard TKL keyboard first and then talk about what the analog brings to the table. Standard features include exactly what you'd expect from any high-end mechanical board. You've got per-key RGB, you've got custom lighting effects, anti-ghosting, in-key rollover, you've got multiple profile storage available to be saved directly to the board and a braided mini USB detachable cable. The base is ABS, it's got two flip-down feet, seven rubberized pads to keep things in place and three different options to route the cable. The sides of the board have these little grooves or indentations that make it really easy to lift and reposition the board. The top plate is a Aluminum, which is kind of a double-edged sword here because you get a nice subdued reflection off the individual RGB lights but at the cost of some fingerprints. It lacks dedicated media keys, a Windows lock key, or any kind of brightness control, so its presentation is really minimal. And I like that, but it struck me as odd because without needing to dedicate any real estate on the frame to any of these features, it seems like they really could have shrank the margins around the key bits. It's subjective for sure, but I like a really minimalist approach on my keyboards, and I would have liked to have seen that here. The quality of the lighting is really nice here. Yes, you get per key, which is not only great for aesthetics, but it's also really handy with this board to remember what you've got assigned to certain analog modes, what you've got binded to certain keys visually. You also get a pretty decent selection of effects with different modifiers for speed and direction, and you can dim it from zero to 100% as well. All this takes place in the Wootility software. Yeah, I I know. And while it does lack the depth of, say, like a Corsair Q software, I can say I've been using this keyboard on my desk for about two months now, and I have not had any crashes or buggy behavior out of this at all, even using it in conjunction with other peripheral software from other manufacturers. The lighting on this board is presented a little differently than most because the color is actually coming from an LED mounted on the PCB, and that's coming up through the clear stem and kind of reflecting off the underside of the keycap. The underside is white, so it's kind of reflecting like an umbrella and then casting that light back down onto the aluminum plate. It's also worth mentioning that you can store up to four different profiles on the board with a different lighting setup for each one, so it's really easy to tell at a glance which mode or which profile you've got selected. The font on the keycaps is really clean, really handsome. There's nothing extreme or gamery or anything over the top going on here, just a really nice presentation. The keycaps themselves are ABS versus PBT, which I've seen draw some criticism online. Now feel free to chime in here, but I cannot think of another manufacturer that makes a board with full PBT keycaps that's also full RGB, especially at this price point, so I'm really confused as to why this is such an issue. But that said, in a seriously smart move from both Flaretech and Wooting, the stems on these switches are Cherry MX compatible, and it uses a standard bottom row, which means you can buy custom keycaps all day if that's what you want to do to make this thing your own. And bonus points here for the Wooting logoed window keys. Not only can you switch out the keycaps here, but you can actually pull and switch out the switches as well. These come in two different flavors right now. There's a Linear 55, which feels and sounds a lot like a Cherry MX Red, and there's a Clicky 55, which is obviously going to be very comparable to a Cherry MX Blue. Wooting's actually cool enough to include four extra linear switches and throw in four of the Clicky switches in the box with the keyboard in the event you need to replace the switch or if you just want to experiment with the Clicky 55 switches to see how they feel or sound alongside a tool that pulls both keycaps 
and switches. Now, a couple things here. First, yes, these switches do have some horizontal wobble, which I have seen people mention online, but I've got a stack of keyboards over here, and the motion on these keys is not any more substantial than any other Cherry MX variant board I have. Second, this board is loud as even with the linear 55 switches installed. Do yourself a favor and get a set of O-ring dampeners and go ahead and install them on there. It goes a long way towards cutting down the overall sound of this board and doesn't seem to affect performance in any way that I could detect. Here's the difference. Now these switches operate a little differently than most because on the PCB there's actually an optoelectric element that shines up through the transparent stem housed in the switch. Because of this, the board has the ability to read key travel per switch of between roughly 1.5 and 3.6 millimeters. So not only can the board emulate an analog mode, but you can also set the actuation point in digital mode. All right, so so far we've got a keyboard that can basically hang with any top flight TKL offering from any other major manufacturer out there Plus it has the ability to set the actuation point on digital mode, switch out to switches, and you can basically tear this thing down to the PCB with a screwdriver. It's built tough, it includes replacement parts in the box, and it looks great on the desk. Really aside from dedicated media keys, the only thing it doesn't include is a wrist rest, which most of the major competitors don't offer either. Okay, now we can talk analog mode. In the simplest terms, this board gives you the ability to take any function that you would find on a popular game controller and bind it to any key on the keyboard using either X input or direct input, but mostly X input. It's important to note here that in analog mode, the keyboard uses the same driver that Windows would use if you were using a wireless 360 receiver. Now I actually own and use a wireless 360 receiver on my main machine, so this caused a couple issues for me that you should probably be aware of. Number one, if you pick up your controller and turn it on, sometimes it's gonna start up as player two. The only way around that would be to go into the device manager and disable the driver that the Wooting keyboard is using, and that's gonna require a reboot. The second issue is that from time to time, if I wanted to use analog controls in a game, particularly Far Cry 5, it was necessary for me to turn on the controller for some reason before the analog controls on the Wooting would wake up and function in game. In practice, if you're gonna use the analog mode on the Wooting keyboard, which you should, you should probably just go into device manager and disable your wireless controller. So it should be pretty obvious by now, but in case it's not, how effective this will actually be on the gaming experience is greatly dictated by the game title itself. I've tried a lot of different games with this thing, and I can tell you the results pretty much range from no distinct advantage to pretty damn impressive. Modern titles with better controller implementation work best. Games like Rocket League are super easy to get set up and get started, and you notice the difference pretty much immediately. CSGO is another game Wooting likes to tout because it gives you a distinct advantage over using a traditional keyboard and mouse setup. With this, it actually gives you the ability to move fast while still retaining the accuracy as if you were moving much slower. Other games require a bit more finesse and patience to get a functional result. In Far Cry 5, for example, I had to go all the way analog or not at all. Now, the reason I say this is because the board has a mode when you're in an analog profile that allows you to retain digital function for the other keys. Now, this presents a couple issues. One, if you're gonna have digital input set as active at the same time you're using analog, you're gonna have to have that actuation pushed all the way as far as it will go because on the key travel, you don't want that digital actuation point to interfere with the analog read points. Two, if you are gonna run analog and digital, the game gets confused and it's presenting you with visual prompts for either a controller setup or a mouse and keyboard setup. Some situations it'll switch wildly between the two. So while the game might feel great, the on-screen presentation looks pretty janky. Once you get it fully set up, however, the vehicles feel really good and it doesn't affect the on-foot or shooter mechanics at all. It's just a nice, easy switch right between the two without having to fumble with the controller or use digital inputs when you're trying to drive. So there is gonna be some heavy lifting required for certain titles to get the performance that you're looking for. The good news here is that for most popular games where analog is really gonna help the experience, somebody has probably already done this work for you. In the Wutility software, you can copy a profile code this is literally just like a string of characters that you copy and paste back into the utility. Once you have that profile, you can assign it to one of the three different analog profiles on the board and keep it locked in there. I tried a pre-made profile for Forza Horizon 3 and it worked super easy right out of the box. In addition to your analog profiles, you also always have an all digital profile. So that brings the total profiles to four. 
Whenever you're in an analog profile, you can hit the mode button to switch directly to your digital and back again to your analog, or you can use the function and the arrow keys to switch between one of your three analog profiles. It sounds wordy when I say it, but in practice it works really great. And of course, the shortcuts to handle all that stuff can be rebinded as well if you need to. So the million dollar question, is the analog mode on this board worth it? Well, there's a reason why I presented the information the way I did in this video. Despite analog mode being the main marketing point of this keyboard, you can take that completely off the table and you still have a very capable top flight TKL board here that while it is missing some convenience features like dedicated media keys or a wrist rest, it brings to the table some insane build quality, great aesthetics, and a level of customization that you're not gonna see from most of its competitors in the form of replaceable switches and set actuation points in the digital mode. Fully utilizing the analog mode is going to be a learning curve because it fundamentally changes the way that you interact with your keyboard. In a digital keyboard, we're used to tapping repeatedly for incremental movements to get the desired effect on screen. With this board, it's gonna be a press and hold at a specific pressure to get the desired effect. Now whether or not that sounds worth it to you is going to greatly depend on how proficient you already are or how much contempt you have for a controller sitting on your desktop. So the jury's still out on whether I will fully embrace the analog mode of this board. If I was the type of player that got my hooks into one game and that's all I really focused on, it would be an automatic for me to set up the keyboard to reflect that one game and I'd forget about it. Due to testing, there's a lot of times where I will play multiple titles in the same day and switch around a lot between games. And that fact is a major reason of why this keyboard earned itself a permanent spot on my desk because not only is it gorgeous, but it's wildly flexible. This thing will adapt to any gaming or editing situation I can see fit to throw at it. And due to its design, it's customizable in virtually any way somebody would want to customize their board. Plus, I really like the idea of supporting smaller companies that are made up of gamers that are trying to make a mark and do something different in the space. The guys at Wooting are constantly interacting with the user base. They listen, they implement changes. They're not just manufacturing a product, they're really making an effort to build a community around this board. I know that sounds corny, but the customer service aspect is something that we just oftentimes don't talk about in reviews, but it's really solid here. This is not your standard keyboard that you take out of the box and plug in and you're off to the races. There's a lot here, but these guys understand that. They know they have a complex product on their hand and they know that they're gonna have to take steps to educate the end user so that you're gonna get the most out of this product. After purchase, you get a total of four weekly emails that ramp up in complexity as you go so that you can really understand everything that this thing is capable of. If at any point in time you're confused, you just go to the website, to their forums, and to their knowledge base, I guarantee there's gonna be an answer in there to fix whatever issue you might be having with your board. If you've ever bought a luxury item or a vehicle in your life, you know that the customer experience is a big part of that value. These guys nail it. Now, if you're watching this and you just can't fathom the idea of moving away from a standard size keyboard, not to worry, Wooting's got you covered. There is a full-size version coming out. It's called the Wooting 2. It's on Kickstarter right now. By the time you see this video, you probably have less than like 48 hours to jump on board and take advantage. So if you're interested, don't sleep on that. That's it for this time. Thanks to the guys over at Wooting for sending this out. World Cup soccer is almost over and I can finally get back to my summer release schedule. So thanks for hanging in there. I'm Brian P. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button, hit that sub button. And until next time, stay up. The base is ABS, it's got two flip down peep. <laughs>